Welcome to the Entre Ed Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Toy Hirschman and Laura McCall. Join us as we dive into incredible stories from inspiring entrepreneurs around the world. Whether you are an educator looking for ideas to engage students, a new learner, or someone who wants to be inspired, our guest journeys and their ideas will give you resources to create value and take your own leap into entrepreneurship. We are so looking forward to sharing our message with you. And don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe to the Entre Ed Talk podcast on whatever platform you listen. Welcome, welcome everybody. We're so excited today. We are gonna be talking with Jason Spencer on Entre Ed Talk podcast. So thank you for joining us. Jason is our dear friend and college partner with Entre Ed. He's currently the assistant professor and outreach coordinator for Bridge Valley Community and Technical College in Charleston, West Virginia, and South Charleston and Montgomery, West Virginia. Jason first graduated from WVU with a bachelor's of science in computer science and a minor in professional writing and editing. He went on to get his graduate degree from Marshall University with a BS and a master's of information systems. Jason currently teaches in the Computers and Information Technology Department with classes such as Introduction to Web Design, Data Communications, Networking and Systems Analysis Design. As an Outreach Coordinator, Jason is involved in many different events, and we'll talk about a lot of those coming up, aimed at K-12 through in the community. Such events include the Capital City Pumpkin Drop, Bex Robotics Tournaments, Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day and STEAM Academy Summer Camp Programs. And we'll definitely get into that one, Jason. Jason participates in various Engineering Week events and STEAM Days that are some smaller in scale, usually partnering with other entities such as Entre Ed. He's very passionate about creating and providing opportunities for young people in the region and sees what skills he can lead to that will help them lead to exciting careers that they may not know about. Jason's a lifelong West Virginia resident in Kanawha County, Charleston area. His desire is to help build a talented workforce so that West Virginia may attract more companies to help build the economy and to help the state continue to develop for future generations. So happy to have you, friend. How are you doing? So happy to be here. Good. So we, um, Toy and I, know Jason quite well. So uh, we'll try not to give you any inside jokes, but we work with Jason on many levels and have for many years. So Jason, you are, a, a, I know you're a wonderful and talented and you know, sought after professor at, at Bridge Valley. Um, I want to know, and I probably know a little bit, but I'm sure I'm gonna learn a lot more. What has been your journey to get you where you are so far as, as an entrepreneur and a teacher of VEX Robotics and all the cool stuff you do? Oh, it's been a winding road for sure. Entrepreneurship in, in my mind has always been kind of like in the back of my head. Um, when I was getting ready to graduate from WVU, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't really think of myself as um, a programmer, which is pretty much the bulk of the skill set that you learn in that degree. And I thought, I can do this, but do I like doing this? And do I want to be sitting at a desk programming all the time? And it's actually funny because I just... Um, moved a bunch of books that were still at my parents' house to my house. And I found a book my mom bought me back in 2009 when I was getting ready to graduate, which is, what business do you want to start? <laughs> and I was like, I don't remember if I read this book, but I, I they thought the, uh, the, um, the mindset was there even then. Um, I actually had a, uh, a very passionate dream that I wanted to create kind of like a technology brand, kind of like um, where you, where like Virgin has like Virgin Airlines and Virgin Mobile and Virgin this. I wanted to create like a, a brand that I could, I wanted to start off with like a magazine style website that could then venture off into like different things like web development services, consulting services and things like this. And that was unfortunately when the magazine market was like plummeting. <laughs> so like the idea of doing it was like, well, how will I pay people anything if they're thinking you know, no one's going to buy your magazine <laughs> or, or subscribe to your site or something. So I, I didn't really pursue it, but I had it all mapped out in my head what I wanted it to look like and what I wanted to do. I was looking at if I could trademark terms and things like that. So I was really looking at the branding of it. Um, I did do a lot of, of freelance web design work. And for a long time, I thought that was going to be my career path. 
Um, I unfortunately never know how much to charge people. So I'm always <laughs> like that person where I'm like, they're like, how much do I owe you? And I'm like, um, uh, what do you want to pay me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bad idea, Jason. Uh, so funny. We, yeah. we keep having this conversation, Laura, it seems like. like the, It's a universal <laughs> it issue. Is. Well, it, it, the it, comes, week. it comes down to the fact that people uh, don't realize how easy some tasks are for me. And so like I something I did in five minutes, they're like, oh, that must have taken you like three days. I'm like, it really didn't. So and you're supposed like, to say, yes, it did. But are then you, you feel that. I'm an empath, so I start feeling bad. Like I'm, I, I don't <laughs> like taking advantage of people. Um, but so that didn't feel like a career I wanted to stay in, but I was doing it like a couple projects here and there. I was basically unemployed for a year because of, from like, with like an actual job, let's say, um, because when I graduated, it's when everyone started like that mini recession we had and people weren't hiring unless you had five to 10 years experience. And it was that catch 22 of how do you get experience if no one wants to hire you because you don't have experience. Um, and then um, the institution that was then known as Canal Valley Community and Technical College was looking for um, adjunct professors to uh, teach their uh, Microsoft Office classes. And a friend of a friend told me to email someone. And basically, I thought I was going to a job interview and they were basically like, can you start Monday? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, sure. So I started doing that. I taught about two to three classes a semester and they had a person who was retiring and they said, you know, if you get your master's degree, you can apply for this job. And he actually retired a semester earlier than planned because of the move to South Charleston. And I guess he just didn't want to pack up his office. I think that was the whole reason he <laughs> retired early. Um, so they actually hired me when I still had one semester left of my master's degree. Um, and I took over a lot of his duties. So that's how I got into teaching. And entrepreneurship was always kind of a um, mindset, not necessarily a uh, a degree, although it is now at Bridge Valley, it wasn't before, but like, how do we get people's skills so they can go to work or work for other people or do other things that will make them money? And that kind of became a mindset that I was stuck in where I was like, how can I help people? Like I, I knew what it was like to not have a job and, and be looking for opportunities. So how can I increase someone else's viability in those areas and whether it's what they want to work for themselves like they want to be a web designer like I tried to be or whether they want to get a job with a company I you know both those mindsets work um, with the stem skill sets that I try and, and, and teach um, young adults and and um, teenagers and, and middle schoolers and whatever it is I'm working in and the transition into all the outreach stuff kind of happened when we became Bridge Valley. Um, uh, I became friends with our outreach director at the time, and she was always looking for people to volunteer. And I, I had worked previously at a summer camp, and so I liked working with kids that age. And I always joke that uh, they're not taller than me yet, so they still see me as an authority <laughs> figure. So like, that's the perfect age for me to teach. Um, that's so. why I never taught in high school, Jason. I, I can't deal with being the shortest person in school. It's the same, I have the same thing with my college students. Like some of them are 18. And I'm like, how are you six feet tall? Like how? I, I, I didn't. Well, it doesn't know. help you have a young face. Just saying. It'll be a good thing in 20 years. But yeah. 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 Um, at one point in time, there was a funny story where all my students were asking if how old I was. I was like, I don't want, I don't want to tell you how old I am. Like that's none of your business. And they kept, they kept would, they would start asking like weird things, like, well, how old were you when nine eleven happened? Or like, how old were you when Y two K? Or like all these things. They were trying to do the math in their head. And then one day I slipped what year I graduated, and they figured it out. And they were like, well, you're not twelve. I'm like, who said I was? And like, they're like, well, we heard a rumor there was a 12-year-old computer teacher, and we just speak it to you. <laughs> and I said this at Faculty Senate one time. And I was like, I don't know where this rumor started. And the vice president, who was right next to me, turned around and was like, oh, my God, I said that in, in the foyer as a joke. 
<laughs> and like people overheard her and thought it was real. And like that became a thing for like, uh, then when we became Bridge Valley, our new president, I was telling her that story and she, she laughed at me and she said, well, we were joking that we were going to tell people you were 15. And I was like, oh, so I gained three years. So, um, it, it's, it's been a joke for a while. So I'm used to it. Well, you're telling you, you're saying you became friends with the outreach coordinator. Of course, uh, Melissa's great. I know her too. And I think you think about being in a, a community college is uh, if, if you make friends, that means you do have extra work. You're right. <laughs> friends well, love to get friends involved. And, and I eventually just told her, I said, you know, just tell me where you want to be and I'll be there because, you know, I feel bad that, you know, she needed volunteers for things. And a lot of times people just ignore those emails or not even read them. And so for as far as the summer camp goes, she made me an assistant director. And then for a lot of the other things, she would just put me in charge of like a single part of it. Like for the pumpkin drop, I'm in charge of them coming through the, the process of checking in and making sure that their apparatus is in compliance and they have all their paperwork. So she just gives me volunteers and I train those people and I'm like, okay, this is what we're doing. And, um, you know, my, my colleague Amanda was similarly in the scoring area. Like she would just, you know, train all the judges. So like, you know, she delegated us because she could count on us to be there. And then unfortunately, um, both those ladies took on new jobs, uh, not, not by plan. <laughs> um, How dare at, they, right? At, at the same time. And it, it just, uh, unfortunately for me, I was the only person left who was, you know, always involved in these events. And, and so those, those duties kind of fell onto me. And so when I was doing them, um, I eventually um, approached our president and I said, you know, I've been doing these things for about a year now and I, I'm, I'm looking for resume building things. I'm looking for, you know, upward mobility. So if other job opportunities with Bridge Valley or otherwise come up, I want to <laughs> be smart. I want to be able to put that on my resume. So she she granted me the title of outreach coordinator and we were planning on reorganizing that entity anyway. And my colleague Michelle, who was formerly in in enrollment, then became the college wide outreach director. So she became my became my supervisor. So I help organize these events and she helps kind of like promote them and make sure they're interacting with other parts of the college and stuff. She's like the overhead. Um, and she's been great. She's been supportive of the whole stuff. She's really jumped in and, and helped and stuff. And unfortunately this was her first year for summer camps. And then we had to like turn it upside down. Um, so it, it's, it's, I've had to explain, well, this is not how we would have done it. If there would have been kids here, this part would have been different. <laughs> so it, it's been, it's been a, a process, but she's been great. She's she, since she, is in a cabinet level position, she can, she's aware of all these other things going on at the college. So when something comes up that might be a, become problematic or a, um, a conflict, she's able to see that ahead of time before it would trickle down to me and, you know, make sure that, you know, our little entity is still getting our stuff done and has the support we need, which I didn't have before by myself because I didn't, I wasn't in cabinet meetings. I was just, you know, like, who wants to go do robots today or whatever? <laughs> <And> so, like, <laughs> You're holding up the umbrella oh, like the tour. Oh my guys. god! <laughs> I, I, um, Jason. I mean, we we worked with Jason as Laura mentioned, and um, I think right when those two people left, I think that's when I met you because because yes. I think it was Melissa, right? And she was like, she was like leaving like the next week, and yeah. then she was like, "Here's Jason." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, sorry about you. Yeah. <laughs> An email was forwarded and I was just like, oh, okay, this is the thing I do now. Uh -huh. So so I, I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit because you mentioned it, but can you talk about what you did to pivot with, with COVID and with your summer camp? Because you did something phenomenal that people need to hear about. Yeah. Um, it, it's And uh, I know this is coming out later, but I'm actually, the, it was funny because I, I am going to be presenting this at uh, the NACI makeshift conference. And so it's, I've actually like detailed out so many things and I keep adding things like, oh, I didn't mention this or, oh, I didn't mention this. So like in my head, I have it all like ready to talk about because I've already been writing it up. <laughs> uh, but uh, so yeah, as everyone knows, the, the global pandemic kind of threw everything in person um, out the window. The schools were closed, buildings were closed, 
you know, everyone was jumping on Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Skype and whatever other methods they can get to communicate with people. Um, so I always, since I've been doing this, I've always opened our summer camp registrations on the Monday of spring break. That way, if there's a calamity, I'm not at work and I can like, <laughs> answer the phone. And I, because you know, you don't want to leave your students that are in class to answer parent phone calls because they can't read subtext or something. Um, because there's always those people who read too quickly and then they there's an answer on the website, but they don't see it. And so you got to answer those phone calls and stuff like that. I'm, I'm one of those people. Which is fine. Which is fine. I want you. I want you to participate. But I have to take time. Out of, I have to take time out of other stuff to answer those phone calls. So I don't want to shortchange my students. So I always do that the Monday of spring break because I can forward my phone to my home phone and and do it from there. Um, so that was March sixteenth. I think is the date. Um, and that's when things were going awry um, because the. Thursday before that, Bridge Valley announced, along with the other colleges in the state, that we were going to be virtual for two weeks following spring break. So everyone knew we were not coming back to campus for at least three weeks, spring break in the next two weeks. So um, I'm like, okay, well, hopefully everyone does this and it, it we flatten the curve and it, and it goes away and everything else that we were foolishly optimistic to think. And so that Monday it opened and traditionally um, it sells out in the first 48 hours. Uh, so I got about half my enrollment on the first day. And then Tuesday, I believe, is when they announced that they were potentially going to be doing like different states were starting to shut down and stuff like that. So they started to trickle down a little bit. Like I was getting like two or three or one or whatever. And I forget when the official announcement came out that the, that the governor said we're doing a stay-at-home order. But once that happened, no more registrations. I didn't have a single one. Um, and so when I got calls from some of our, our partners, um, like, for example, I was going to have a paleontologist come in and talk to kids uh, because we have a new uh, T-Rex uh, dino museum thing in Charleston. And so I wanted to promote their business and I wanted to, to him to, you know, how often do you talk about to a paleontologist in person? Yeah. So yeah. I, I thought that would be really cool. And so um, his boss got in, cause he's from out of state. He comes in for on every other weekend for the, to work in the museum. And so he was going to come in and come to the Friday session. Uh, cause that would fit in his schedule. He wouldn't have to adjust his schedule. Um, he was going to bring stuff like some fossils and things for them to see and everything. It was going to be great. And so his boss calls me and says, so what's the plan due to the pandemic? And I was like, we are going to reevaluate in May because um, the first camp was in June. And we'll see what we need to change or what the guidelines say at that point in time. Because so, at that time, the guidelines were changing every single day. Um, if you remember, they um, at first they were like trying to not let common people steal up all the PPE uh, so they were like, you know, stay inside. Don't worry about masks. You don't need masks inside your own house. And then it was like, okay, if you go outside, you need a mask. And then it was like, but only if you're getting food or, you know, like they, they were changing or being more restrictive as time went on. And so I didn't want to commit to something if I was going to change it every single week. Um, so, and then the, I think the first week of April, we had an outreach meeting and basically I was told the We'd, we'd already announced we were staying virtual the spring semester um, because it was just it was just too risky otherwise. And we did not have a good plan in place to, to properly clean the facilities and everything else. So uh, the president had told my supervisor that she did not want us to cancel the camp. And she said, find a way to keep it. So the, it kind of fell on me to like, do what you can. And I was, I was told the guideline was kind of like, we can shorten it and we can um, change the enrollment numbers, whatever we need to do. Um, and someone suggested like, maybe we can mail them supplies or something or do, or we can let them come in the parking lot to pick them up. But like, how are we going to do this? So looking at our numbers, I was suddenly like, well, we don't need counselors because we don't have kids on site. We don't need to pay for food because we don't, we're not. We're not mailing them Chick-fil-A or, or pizza 
or whatever it is we were going to eat. Sure, that some day. parent asked, though, can we still get that, right? No, yeah. <laughs> Nope, sorry. Um, we decided not to get them t-shirts because it's an excess expense. Um, and one of the main things for getting a t-shirt was we want, we took a group photo every week. Uh, so it was like, well, we're not even gonna get a group photo. So why, why use that expense? Even though we only pay, I think $6 a shirt for 50 to 100 people, that's a lot of money. Um, upwards of $600 if you're gonna do 100 people. So, um, when you reallocate all those funds, you suddenly have a lot more stuff for supplies. And normally we would have to buy like a classroom set that we could use multiple times. Uh, in most cases, it's some stuff where there's like chemistry stuff that has to go down the drain immediately afterwards. That's not the case, but um, so we were like, well, let's see what activities we want to do and see how what, what it's gonna cost supply wise. And so we decided to do five activities one week long activity that they build on and build on and build on as the week goes on. And then daily activities that are smaller that, that they just do that day. And so we had five activities in total and two of them did not require any physical supplies because they're all on a computer. So technically I only had to buy supplies for three things. Um, and so that allowed for the bigger one to have a, a, a larger budget um, cause each kid had to have their own thing. And that means they get to keep something, which is what we always try and do at the camp. Anyway, you'll have at least one thing they get to take home. Usually it was something they 3d printed, but you can't give every kid a 3d printer. Um, at least not now, uh, maybe in 10 years, um, when they're 20 bucks and we can ship them a 3d printer or something. Um, but so we, we, we went with that model of buying the supplies from everything else. And then we, we need to find out how to deliver this content. And everyone was pitching, oh, well, the schools are using Zoom or, you know, we're using Microsoft Teams at Bridge Valley for a lot of stuff because, it, but that's because we already have the environment in place. Um, everyone at Bridge Valley has an Office 365 account, which means you can automatically sign into Microsoft Teams. That does not work for people who are outside the college. Um, Zoom meetings only like we're in right now. Those of you listening can't see, but I can see Laura and Toy right now. Um, and if either of us wanted to share our screen, that would be possible. However, if you need to show multiple camera angles or if you need to show like an overhead shot, so if you're building something, you can't do that in Zoom. It's not feasible. So I can't be switching angles and getting the best presentation. So I don't know about either of you, but my mom is a big... QVC home shopping fan. So I've watched a fair amount of this in my life. I even have an account. I won't, I won't lie. I have an account. <laughs> and we're underscoring what, that for the podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I have a QVC account. account. Yes. <laughs> Big fan would recommend. Um, so uh, I love the idea, especially like <laughs> During Christmas, my mom would frequently buy stuff and she's trying to hide it so she doesn't open the box and she forgets what she ordered. And then by the time we get it, we're like, I'm not really sure how to use it because I forget what they said. And then like six months later, you'll see it on TV again because they have a surplus of it. And so you're like, oh, pay attention so we know how to use this. And so I thought, okay, on home shopping, they are demonstrating how to use a product. But what if you actually had the product and could follow along? So this is where I got the idea cool. of streaming it like it's almost like a, a broadcast station, right? So we made their little boxes with all their supplies. We got all that, right? So we are then using those supplies in a video format where we can switch camera angles just like a TV station um, and show them step-by-step step how to build them. Now, the other aspect of, of home shopping is in the old days, they only had phones and you could call in and give a testimonial or ask questions or things like that. Um, and sometimes those are hilarious. Um, I believe there are really good bloopers on um, YouTube somewhere. So, you know, plug for that, I guess. Um, so in modern times, they also take on questions, I think, from social media, like their Facebook pages or their Twitter pages and things like that. So there's more of a, you don't have to wait on a phone to ask a question. You can just ask it of the, of the moderator because they have a moderator on set sometimes. So 
YouTube Live, which is what I was advocating to use, allows for a chat room. And the reason I was advocating for YouTube Live is unlike some of these other streaming services like Mixer or um, Twitch, things that are focused more on gaming or people who are profiting off their streams in some ways, um, YouTube is a brand name now. It has been around for 15 years, came out in 2005 when I graduated high school. <laughs> so there I just aged myself for everyone if you want to do the math. Um, so um, parents know what it is. They trust YouTube to an extent. They, they probably have oftentimes given their phone to their kid and been like, here, go watch YouTube, right? Um, don't lie, you've done it. <laughs> so... Um, so and also kids know what it is because kids enjoy watching youtube videos right actually my uh, kids show me youtube videos all the time and it is funny okay. my stepfather just turned um 70 last year and he's a mr fix it type and he used to google how to fix stuff and now he youtubes how to fix stuff and He'll come over and be like, I figured it out. And like, he'll fix like whatever is broken at my house. And I'm like, that's awesome. And so like, you know, it's not an age thing. Anyone can watch YouTube and learn something. Now I'm not saying there's not some trash on YouTube because there is, there's trash everywhere. Um, we are garbage human beings sometimes. Um, but it's a trusted platform. And that was the key. People know what it is. They're not scared of it. They're not um, skeptical because even like Zoom had an issue with security really early on during the pandemic and it scared a lot of people. Um, so YouTube has that fundamental difference in terms of being less iconic in a, in a way, right? Um, so uh, that's why I chose it. In addition to having, so we have that chat. So we decide to have a moderator, just like they would have on Home Shopping, moderate the chat. So when they have a question, the moderator asks who's ever presenting, whatever it is. And you know, a lot of times they'll say, can you go over that again? Or slow down a minute. Timing is a big issue with these things because there's a slight delay. So by the thing they're asking you a question of might be something like you did the previous step because you've already moved on. So you don't have the benefit of seeing their faces and know they get it and that they're with you. So you have to kind of, that's the biggest hurdle is realizing how fast you need to go. And whatever speed you think you need to go, go 10 times slower. Um, because it, it's, it's the technology, not you. It's not you're being a bad teacher. It's that they're behind because of the nature of streaming. Um, the other thing we offered was we know with every class, there's a shy person sometimes multiple shy people, especially in a situation like this where they don't know each other. This might be the first time that they've ever talked to these kids, right? So they might not want to ask their question in the chat um, and let everyone see it. Now, if there was some kind of bullying situation going on, we have the ability to kick them out or put them in what's called a timeout uh, where you can literally pause them for like five minutes so they're not allowed to say anything in the chat for five minutes. Um, we had a kid who was spamming random stuff about food and he claims it was his little sister when he went to the bathroom, but. <laughs> this, is, this is fascinating. I do, I do not I know if it was or not, but so we, uh, we, we, cause he wouldn't stop saying whatever food item he was saying. So we just, you know, put him in a timeout for five minutes. So he couldn't type anything for five minutes. Um, so if there was a bullying situation, you could handle that. But if this kid did not want to ask their question, we set up what's, what's called a Google voice number. And basically it's a number you subscribe to with your Google account and you can make calls from it. I'm not sure you can make 911 calls or emergency calls, but you can make calls with it. Um, and you can also receive text messages and you can read them in your web browser. You don't have to be on a device to do it. So we had a second moderator taking text messages. Um, so if the kid wanted to text a question, they could do that. And so we could read those aloud as well. We also had a phone number set up um, with the college with a special voicemail uh, set up. It says, it's me talking. It's like, thanks for calling Steam from home. Um, we're on the phone with another caller right now and um, leave your name and number and we'll get back to you. Um, and so we let parents call and they could put their kid on the phone if they want, but we're not calling the students directly without parent permission. And we don't want the kids calling us every five minutes with a question. Uh, otherwise they would. Um, 
And sometimes kids are talkative anyway. And so it'd be like, uh-huh, uh-huh, good job, great, uh-huh. Okay, well, there's someone else on the phone. I got I to gotta go. Uh, so we didn't want that recurring over and over again. And uh, my colleague, Mr. John Brown, who is doing the long-term project, he had more questions than me most of the time because yeah. the project is more complex. Um, Shout out to John Brown. He oh, is a friend of mine. He's phenomenal. He is the best. I love having him at our camps. And he's a he's a veteran of STEAM Academy and now STEAM from home now. But he would take five-minute breaks every once in a while and say, like, go use the bathroom, go whatever. And if you need me to call, have your parent call right now. And then he would he would take questions via phone during those breaks. Uh, so he was very vigilant with that and very good with that. And sometimes we stayed after the stream ended to talk to some of the kids who were like, like they got behind somehow and catch them up. Uh, so we had three modes of contact. Um, we also set up a Remind app, which I had heard of, never used, because I don't have children. Um, but apparently lots of schools use it to remind kids of events and homework or whatever it is they're doing. Um, and we did this because we had a day of technical difficulty where, where our equipment failed and we couldn't use the cameras. Um, so we had to put up like a, a random logo that said like, please stand by. And just so we could get in the chat and be like, hey, uh, give us 10 minutes or whatever time and frame it was going to take. And those um, videos, because every time you go live, it records the video and puts it on your YouTube channel. So those little two or three or four minute videos we did saying, please stand by, try and talk to the kids, got flagged as spam <laughs> by YouTube. And they gave them strikes. And your first strike, you get suspended for seven days. Huh? So I had to appeal all these things and oh be like, it was an accident. We deleted these videos. Oh. Um, and I won the appeal. So the strikes were removed, but they forgot to take off the suspension. So we were still suspended for seven days. Um, so we had to go to a backup channel, uh, which was one of our producers. He um, he streams video games. So he had a channel already. So we used his channel on the last day. Um, so for the second camp, we have two backup channels so of our own. So they're already playing with Bird Valley or whatever. <laughs> In case you get kicked off YouTube. Again. Yeah, uh, but for us, uh, so I, I, I assume the algorithm sees that you have only a static logo and they presume it's advertising or something. And so once you say, hey, this is just our standby logo because we're having technical difficulties, they, t they remove the strike once an actual person re reviews your appeal. Uh, but the the bots on YouTube that are doing all the moderating and stuff like that, that that's what's flagging it. So I told our our producers, I was like, do not go live with only a logo. If you're gonna go live, make sure someone gets in front of that camera and says whatever, because then the bot at least sees there's motion, it sees there's people doing stuff, and it's not gonna flag us for it. So we were doing a test stream to make sure the new equipment we got, we got a new camera. We were making sure it worked. And I told John, I was like, just, just go review what's in the box and we'll put it on Facebook or something for kids to see what's in the box. And so he's up there talking. It was, it was funny because when he started, I thought he was talking to me. He's like, no, I'm talking to the camera. Sorry. <laughs> so it was just, we just fooled around for like 40 minutes testing the equipment and going over what's in the box and what to expect for the camp. And, and, we did that all for our own purposes, but also so YouTube wouldn't freak out at us. It was a two prong uh, <laughs> testing purposes. Um, it's a little thing, and I think it, you know, for folks who don't know John, so John is also a former middle school teacher. So I think that's very apropos. Middle school teachers are used to a lot of curveballs throughout the day, and John was an like, awesome addition to have. He, he has just started a new middle school in um, in Raleigh County, I believe. Good to hear. Good. I think he started there last year. I didn't know what name of it was last year. I knew he changed jobs, but I didn't know what it was until this year. Cool. So Jason, you know, I, I know, Toy and I know you personally, so we know you just exude passion and, and, and positivity. And yet I know there's challenges in, in working with students and you work, you know, with the VEX Robotics and the STEAM and all kinds of things in middle school all the way up through community college where you're a professor. So how do you deal with some of the challenges or what are some of the challenges of teaching students to critically think in this age of computers, you know? Um, 
it's funny because their their first mentality is always let's Google it, um, and th- that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but you want them to think for themselves first, and that's kind of the first thing to kind of think. <laughs> How do I get them to actually think about this? And it's funny because we had a mock crime scene. Um, a couple years ago with the um, Washington State Police and their forensic lab. And they came up and it, they had, they, we set up this crime scene. It was, it was um, based off a true like case that they had. The names were changed and the, the, the characters were changed and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it actually happened. It wasn't made up. Um, and we broke the team, the kids into teams. I think they were teams of four and, um, they, um, (laughs) they, they didn't always like their team, which was something (laughs) else, but it's a skill they still need to be. That's life. Yeah. You need to learn to work with other people. Um, but I think we had the, the team that actually reviewed the, everyone got to see the crime scene, but only one group was the one that was collecting the evidence in the crime scene. Uh, so there was a team that actually was like the CSIs going in there and getting, like taking photos and detailing and bagging stuff. Um, and the police officer walked them through exactly how that would be done and everything. Everything was taped off. They had real co- uh, police tape, um, real little markers with the numbers on it. Um, fake blood, obviously, uh, because that's gross. Um, but then we had a group that was in charge of fingerprinting. We had a group that was in charge of tool marks and physical evidence. And then we had a group that was in charge of DNA. And then we had a group that was in charge of reviewing police statements and witness statements and trying to find out like, well, who's not telling the truth here? Like what story doesn't add up with this timeline? Um, And so what we would do is each group would kind of make their own report. And I think that's important because they have to document like what, what they found. Do not make assertions, but like what, what did you find to be true? Okay. And then they would have one person from their group present it. And we had um, a whiteboard kind of like you see in crime scene shows. And we would put up what their report said, what this report said, what this report said. And so at the end, we asked them based on everything you see here, what would your assertion be? Because you wouldn't want like the one group that did like the, the physical evidence to be like, well, this had to be the murder weapon because look at it. (laughs) <laughs> or something like that or like this person had to do it a clue, right yeah and the trick the, the trick was it was not a murder because the autopsy report showed the victim had a heart attack and died of the heart attack now she had a head wound because she had fallen and hit in her head upon having the heart attack so it looked like she had been attacked with an object in the room because she had the escaping head wound um and there was blood everywhere right so you immediately think oh this woman was killed but actually she had a heart attack and died of natural causes now there was an intruder and that's why the police were called because there was a robbery in place but the the suspect did not kill her so you could not argue necessarily that it was murder you could i think the officer said in some states you could argue manslaughter or or, um, unintentional manslaughter or something of that there was a adverb in there like a caveat that you know this because she had the heart attack because this person broke into the her house you could argue that but you couldn't say he murdered her um so being able to think critically upon gaining new information i think is an important skill that we've sadly almost lost in society because people once they see one thing they're like that's it that's it they don't wait for additional information. They don't wait to find out details. They see a headline, they agree with it, right? So um, this allowed them to see how it built on each other and see how all the evidence worked together to, to build a cohesive story and an account of what happened. Um, and all of them got it. Um, so I can't complain about that. Like they they did a great job. And I kudos to the state police because... We changed this model probably like three times because um, originally this is this was the year I took over 
that like she had originally, I guess, talked to my my predecessor briefly and had a brief idea of what we were doing. And then I was like, okay, but what if we did this? <laughs> and then like, so it changed her approach and they couldn't agree to come for a whole week. So they couldn't do like every single day. So we had every afternoon, we had something special to do. And so they had one afternoon totally just working with the kids. And I think they had 90 minutes to do the whole thing, which is longer, maybe two hours. It was longer than every other class we had because of it. And that's probably one of the greatest things that we got to do since I've been doing Steam Academy as a director. Um, so that was pretty cool. That's awesome. I bet the kids loved it. Did anyone, was anybody like terrified though? Um, <laughs> you can imagine. I had one to go student that was like, um, I can't see blood, I can't see blood. And I was like, it's not real blood. Like we made it in a bottle and like <laughs> at the end she was fine. But like when we told her there was fake blood, she like was like, I can't see blood, I can't see blood. You hadn't gone through that seventh grade um, dissect a frog lesson yet, I guess? I guess not. Um, we didn't um, have to do that when I was in school. Like we, I think we had a choice, like you were in a group and someone got, because there weren't enough frogs. <laughs> There's a frog shortage. Um, so I was like, you do it. I don't want to look at it. And so I didn't have to do it. So. Yeah. yeah. My daughter is not, not really the science oriented person, pretty squeamish. She was paired with a guy and for that assignment. And, you know, she, you know, you would think the guy would be all over it. I hate to say that, but just stereotypes. She's like, oh, give me the scaffold. I'll get the eyes out. And she just like, <laughs> little her tickle. <laughs> I guess there weren't enough frogs in her class either. Oh, you guys, I'm going to be sick. So stop talking about blood. And frogs. <laughs> oh my goodness, Jason. So um, I wanted to come back to something you said at the beginning about entrepreneurship as, as a mindset. And I'm curious how, you know, STEM and entrepreneurship, we talk about a lot because they go together like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, it's just entrepreneurship is kind of the, the reason sometimes for STEM, like you build a, you know, you do a robotics, why would you do this activity? Or you do green screen, what, what would you really do this? For? You know, where's the, it, it's like the next question, right? So can you talk just for a minute about how you're able to find, help students kind of find their passion when they're doing these different activities and show them how it applies to their real life? Okay, so since I've been doing the camps, there's always like one activity that certain kids like don't like. They're like, I don't want to do it. Like, um, and sometimes it's robotics. Um, some of the, the, the girls per se, like don't want, I hate to say that because we, you know, we do all this STEM stuff specifically for girls a lot of times, but they're just like, I don't care. And they're like, when you make them do like, you know, where everyone gets a turn, they're like, you can skip me. And I'm like, no, give it a try, give it a try. And you try and, and, and get them excited about it in a different way a lot of the boys will like it because you're holding a, a like a controller that looks like a video game controller and they're all like yeah let's do this and they're like when do we get to f make them fight and you have to remind them it's not battle bots um but with some of the girls you know i've been like well do you like puzzles no like, some of them will be like yeah I don't know. yeah that's fine i'll like, do you like mysteries or solving stuff and i'm like because this is a problem we need to solve this problem with the robot and a lot of times you're doing stuff that like you're moving rings in a certain way or you're moving boxes in a certain way the game changes every year so it can be anything so you try and phrase it like something that they're interested in or you try and like make them look at it like it's not just like tonka trucks or something like that, that that's very boy centric or aimed at a particular audience um and and get them to view it differently or with the um with the um, green screen stuff, some of the boys don't like, <laughs> it's funny because the girls really seem to like that one because they, they I, I don't know if it's because of the design aspect of it or or the fact they are more patient in most cases than a lot of the boys are like, I can't figure it out, oh my God. Uh. Um, especially uh, like fifth grade boys, they will like throw a temper tantrum if they can't figure it out like two clicks. And you're like, you're clicking the wrong thing. We have to click over this, um, whatever. But um, the girls will figure it out. And once they figure it out, they're like, okay, well, how can I do this further? So they're trying to add more stuff while you're just trying to get the boys to 
to participate. Um, but a lot of times around that seventh, sixth and seventh grade age, the kids develop this sense of like, they don't like the way they look or they like don't like being on camera or whatever it is. So they get kind of camera shy and don't want to do the green screen thing. So I don't really do it with the older kids, but I still do it with the younger kids. And usually if we do a five day camp, the last day I let them do a music video for fun. Usually I make them do like a, a news reel or, or something STEM related where they're reporting on something and they, they have to do research about what they're going to report about. Um, and so it's not just, let's jump in front of a screen, but then I let them do that on the last day. So the first year we did this, we had all these requests uh, for songs that I deemed as inappropriate for children <laughs> for a multitude of reasons. Um, so Is there it, callers on that, Jason? Um, it's, it's more like, uh, like the older you get, you realize what some of the lyrics mean. <laughs> And they don't know what it means, but you know what it means. And you're like, you're not dancing to that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so <laughs> I did a thing. I think last year I did this. I came up with two songs <laughs> from every decade going back to the, the 50s. So I did 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Uh, we weren't out of the 2010s yet, so I wasn't doing 2010s. Um, so I came up with two songs and each group had to pick a decade, not knowing what the songs were, like they were in envelopes. Okay. And then they had to do one of the two songs there. So they had a choice, but their choice was limited to two. And they would be like, well, I don't even know that one or like whatever. <laughs> so I was like, go listen to it. So like I had one group that it was like, I don't remember what the other choice was, but it was NSYNC's Bye Bye Bye. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't remember what the other song was, because these were the 2000s. And they didn't like, they could not agree on what to do for the other one, because they, they originally picked the other one. And one of the girl counselors was, was like a big NSYNC fan, I think. And she was like, well, you should just do the NSYNC song, because that's like iconic, and there's already a dance. And they're like, what do you mean? And then we felt really old, because they didn't know what you know this little hand thing and um so i was like oh i know the dance and because i danced a lot in high school so i showed them what the dance is and they're like can you just do that and we um we follow you and so i i had to convince them to do it which is mimicking what i'm doing i'm not on camera but they are and it was funny because i think i twisted my ankle that day trying to to help them through this and i had to go to the urgent care to make sure i didn't do it <laughs> something okay i just want to say jason i knew i was gonna learn something new about you even though you're a dear friend dancing forte was not what i expected to learn but thank you yes i was one of the few uh guys that would dance in high school it was seen it was seen as very unmanly and i was like i don't care i'll do whatever this has flown jason this time has flown i know i just looked i was like oh my god I know. so i really want you know you have so many experiences you definitely talked about the ups and the downs of entrepreneurship of teachers and the challenges and the challenges for teachers the challenges for students do you have some tidbits of advice that you would give folks um yeah and this is something i have found true in all levels of education and I kind of think my third grade teacher, uh, shout out to Mrs. Ledbetter, uh, you saved my uh, educational life uh, in the early 90s. I was not a fan of school until I had her as a teacher. Um, and I don't remember if it was at the same time, but I was that kid after school. I was like, let's play school. Um, <laughs> so like I should have known I was going to get into education uh, at some point in my life, but that wasn't the clear goal but um let people make mistakes um that's how people learn um we have such a perfectionist society and i say that as someone who has anxiety about being a perfectionist um and if you're too anxious or scared to try because you're not going to do it perfectly you'll you'll never do it and if they have that safety net of knowing it's okay if I mess up, they will try more things, whether it's 
um, taking a shot at on um, doing something uh, mathematically and making a mistake. You know, we have erasers that can erase it, do it. Um, if you're doing it on a computer, hit that backspace button, try again. Um, so I do that even in my college classes. I give multiple attempts on things like multiple choice quizzes. So if you really screwed up, um, go read the chapter again and see what you didn't learn the first time. Um, it encourages them to keep learning. I don't want to fail you and then they're like, oh, that's it. I guess I'm dumb. No, uh, you still can learn. So like, I understand you can't do that with a final exam because by that point you need to show what you know. But like during the semester, um, I believe second chances provide that kind of comfort to people to try. And uh, trying is half the battle with some things, and especially with kids. Um, if you want them to do something and they start like having a panic attack because they don't think they can do it right, just be like, do it. If you mess up, I'll do it again. Like, it's not the end of the world. And we shouldn't have that mentality of it has to be perfect the first try. Um, and I think that engages people more because they know that they're, they're going to try. They're going to actually give it their, their all their first time because they don't have that stress factor anymore. And with robotics, you know, I had kids, you know, rebuilding their robot a week before competition because they understood that, you know, if they're not happy with it, they can try again. They're not tied to that model. The robot comes apart for a reason. Uh, you can rebuild it. Um, so if, if we're talking about things like we want people to make things, do you think Mark Zuckerberg uh, made Facebook the first time and was like, <laughs> thank God it's perfect. Like, he, you know, software goes through iterations, iterations, iterations. Do you think Bill Gates, when he was making uh, windows in, in his garage or whatever, the, however the story goes, um, he was like, well, that's it. I guess I'll stop. No, they keep trying. They keep trying to perfect it. Think of all the prototypes Apple's gone through probably that we've never seen because, you know, they didn't get it right the first time. To have that mentality for our kids, I think hurts more than it helps. So I think if you're going to be an educator or you're going to be someone who's a proponent of entrepreneurship or STEM in general, keep trying. There are business people who went to go create a business who had several flawed businesses beforehand before they had a successful one or a successful venture or a successful invention. Don't limit people by making them think they have to be perfect. Keep trying, keep working at it. And you could almost say that on like a, a personal spiritual level, keep working on yourself. Total, totally agree with that philosophy. So Jason, uh, we're going to wrap up, but we've, so, I'm so glad that you've been on today because I, your your advice and especially I love that you shared your your tips for for YouTube and and putting stuff online because you just had a huge undertaking with that and and you're right because you you know you wouldn't have been able to do that if you didn't know you were going to make I mean you knew right up from the get go you were going to make mistakes <laughs> because that, and and I think a, a lot of teachers going online they kind of have that perfectionist thing too going oh you know, I'm not, it's not gonna be perfect. So they're afraid to put it out there and they just need to put it out there. So, um, but anyway, thank you. I do want to add one thing that all the software we used was free. We did not pay for any Very software. Cool. Even the streaming software, which is called open broadcasting software. I don't think I said that out loud. All that stuff is free. So it's not like you have to spend any of your money buying software. That's awesome. I'm glad that you shared that. But, but again, thank you so much for, for being on and we'll look forward to this podcast and for future ones with you. We can't wait to see how the rest of the, the camps go and, and what happens in the, in the fall. <laughs> so it'll be, it'll be interesting. Know. We're already talking virtual pumpkin drop. So we'll see how that goes. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> It's a lot of upset parents about that one, I'm sure. Yeah, well, we don't even have a model in place yet. We just said, we got to look at this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Fun, fun, fun. Thank you for having me.